Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Golden Kite Awards Show. I'm Sarah Baker, the new Executive Director of SCBWI, and I'm so happy that you're joining us today from wherever you may be around the world. I'm speaking to you from the Catskills in New York, and I want to acknowledge that the land where I speak from belongs to the Haudenosaunee and the Mohegan peoples. Thank you to our ASL interpreters, Jenny Kamen and Lynn Kelly. So the Golden Kites were started in 1973, and they are the most prestigious literary awards for children's books that are judged specifically by our peers. As creators themselves, the judges for these awards know firsthand the amount of dedication and passion that go into creating excellent literature for children. I can think of no higher honor than being recognized by your peers. Our incredible and distinguished judges poured through over 900 entries for this year's awards. And after a year's worth of incredible reading and possibly declining eyesight, they have made their selections. Thank you judges for your tireless efforts and commitment to the elevation of children's literature. Also thank you to Bonnie Bader, member of SCBWI's advisory council for administering the Golden Kite Awards. We have awards tonight for the categories of picture book text, picture book illustration, nonfiction text for younger readers, nonfiction text for older readers, middle grade fiction, illustrated book for older readers, and young adult fiction. The Sid Fleischman Award for Humor will be announced in conjunction with our summer conference. And before we start handing out the awards, we have a special treat, some opening words from one of children's books most exciting and dynamic voices, Jason Reynolds. Jason is a number one New York Times bestselling author of more than a dozen books for young people, the recipient of a Newbery Honor, a Prince Honor, an NAACP Image Award, and multiple Coretta Scott King Honors. And he is the current natural, <laughs> national ambassador for young people's literature. So please enjoy this talk from Jason and enjoy The Golden Kite. Hi everybody, it's, it's, it's so good to be here. It's always good to, to share a few moments, a few minutes with SCBWI folks. Um, and hopefully this will be just a few words of encouragement as you all embark on uh, this next portion of the SCBWI uh, platform. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about today. I, 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 you know, I was asked to speak a little while ago and I think my life unfortunately has sort of put me into put me in a situation where I don't I don't you know I, I can't write a lecture every day right it's like one of those things where like I'm always trying to figure out well what exactly have I not said and in what ways can I can I frame some of my um some of the things that I'm thinking about some of the things that I think we're all thinking about and then and this is all true I try not to lie uh, just because it doesn't really serve me except for when I'm writing books um I I got a phone call this morning. I've been on the road for the last two weeks, uh, all over the place, kind of jumping around the country, doing some things since the world is slowly opening back up and I'm taking advantage of it while, while, while I can. And my mom was like, yo, can you come past the house? Uh, Cause I know I have to travel on Wednesday. I'm not going to see you. So can you come by the house to uh, fix the mailbox? Now, typically the relationship with my mother as anyone who knows me knows we're very close, uh, very close. And as she gets older, our relationship pretty much become has become me doing all the things, right? It's like, Jason, can you teach me how to use the printer? Recently, she was like, Jason, can you teach me how to take a selfie? Uh, she's 76. Um, so a lot of the selfies are either of her chin or up her nose or right. But this is sort of what we're experiencing at this particular point in her life as she enters into her twilight years. It's really just me trying to keep her up with technology and also just doing the things that uh, that a child does for his, his mom, right? Um, so I go see her this morning, seven o'clock in the morning, because I knew I had lots of things to do today, because there are always lots of things to do. And I get to her house, it's cold outside, her mailbox, the door for the mailbox is hanging off the mailbox, right? My mother is a very proud woman. She is, uh, so, so this is so this is unbearably embarrassing for her to have this mailbox that's looking a little raggedy in this neighborhood, even though everybody mailbox is raggedy in this neighborhood. But for her, it's like, 
nah, we don't, you know, I need to make sure that we sort of comport ourselves. And I want to, I want to make sure that our home looks a certain way and that our mailbox looks a certain way. It's all about the details, right? Of course, I'm thinking to myself, but the, the, the address stickers have come off this mailbox years ago. At least two of them have, and there's two left. And you never seem to have a problem with the fact that only two of the address numbers are on the mailbox. But alas, here we are, right? She cares about what she cares about and she cares about the mailbox door. So I get there and I'm, 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 I'm looking at the mailbox, I'm assessing it, right? And my mother is like, Jason, you just gotta, we gotta fix the mailbox. You, we, you just gotta figure this out. And I'm like, mom, like, I, okay. I mean, because we're also at that point in our lives where it's, it's sort of one of these things where whatever my mother says is something that I just do. Uh, that's pretty much been my whole life. But at this point it's different because now I do it because I feel like she deserves it, you know? I feel like she deserves it. And I also understand that she's a part of a vulnerable population, right? Our elders are a part of a particular, a particularly vulnerable population. And what happens is we tend to sort of dismiss them uh, as if they no longer, as if they ain't raise us, right? It's a weird thing that happens. And so I, I try to always just say yes, no matter what the ask is. And sometimes the asks get a little ridiculous, but the answer still has to be yes. This actually was not a ridiculous ask, right? This is a mailbox. She needs a mailbox. The door is hanging off. And we all know that like at the end of the day, especially when you're her age and when you live in the community that she lives in, she's a little bit concerned that people can get their hands on her letters, on her, on her bills. On My mom believes that everything has a social security number on it. She's a part of that generation. That's like, if they get my social security number, I'm like, I promise you, your social security number is on no piece of mail that you receive. But to her, it's like, no, no, no. It's on there. My account numbers are on there. My bills are on there. You know, letters are going to be in there. Who knows? But I need to make sure that I have a good, by the way, people can just open up your door, the, the mailbox door. It's not like it's locked. But still, I understand her concern right? I'm with her. I get the concern. So I get to the house and I'm like, Ma, I need, I, I didn't bring my tools, but I know you got some tools in here. Let me go get some screwdrivers and let me get this mailbox off the post. It's 40 degrees in DC and this, and, and this morning is 30, 38 degrees, right? I'm, I got a sweatshirt on, I'm cold and I'm sitting here and I'm trying to unscrew the screws so that I can get the old mailbox off the post. But because it's been sitting out in the, in the rain and in the snow and in the elements for the last 20 years, all the, the screws are sort of rusted. And so I'm having a time, right? And the screws are sort of worn down and they've stripped themselves, right? Just through sheer uh, time and, and, and weather, they, they become stripped. And so I can't quite get the, screw to, the screwdriver to work. So I'm using my hands to unscrew this thing. And this is a terrible experience. My hands are bleeding. I'm scared that I'm going to have tetanus. I'm going through all of these sorts of things as I'm trying to get all of the screws out of the mailbox, right? The, the, eventually, I have to literally, I get three screws out, but I can't get one screw out because it's really jammed in there. So I have to like literally break the mailbox off the post by bending it back and forth until the metal just kind of breaks off. And then I've sort of freed the mailbox from the post, right? My mother the whole time is standing at the front door you know, just watching it all go down, inspecting the same way she used to inspect when we were children, which was a little traumatizing for me, but it was, I understood it. You know, she wanted to make sure that I was doing my thing the right way. Then she says, we got to go get a mailbox. I thought she had a mailbox. Turns out she didn't have, a, she didn't replace the mailbox yet. I want you to come with me. We're going to go to Home Depot. We're going to get a mailbox. And like I said, the answer is always yes. So we go to Home Depot. And we pull up in the Home Depot. My mom moves very slowly at this age, right? And I try to be as patient as possible um, because, because she's been patient with me for a very long time. And so we move very slowly, you know, just kind of bopping through the, through the Home Depot aisle after aisle until we get to the mailbox aisle. Then we cruise on down the mailbox aisle. And here we are in sort of this, this, this cornucopia of different mailboxes, right? We have like the metal mailboxes, big ones and small ones. You got some that are bronze and some that are black. You got your plastic mailboxes. You got your new age plastic mailboxes that come with a whole fancy post. You've got these new like little small boxes that they, they have now that you can just put. Like I live, where I live, we have row houses. So you don't have these, you have the ones you just put on the, on the wall of your home, right? If you don't have a mail slot, right? So all these different options and we're going through the options and my mother is trying to figure out which is going to be the option for her right and of course i'm thinking like let's just get a plastic mailbox this is my thought and she's like we can't get a plastic mailbox because they're too cheap and i say to her ma plastic is practically indestructible right it's the reason why we have to recycle right it's indestructible but it does not degrade right whereas rust literally eats away the weather eats away at steel 
right? At metal, it, it eats it up. It's the reason why our cars aren't steel anymore. It's the reason why when you drive around our neighborhood, all your neighbors ain't got no doors on their mailbox because they have metal mailboxes, right? And so I'm trying to explain this to her, but she's like, I don't know, it, it, it just feels cheap. I don't think it's gonna last in the snowstorm. And I'm like, I promise you, it, your car is made of plastic. I promise you it will last in a snowstorm, right? But the truth is, is that what she didn't want to say is she liked the way the metal ones look better. And I understand, right? They do look a little better. It's got kind of a chic feel. I get it, right? So we go through the metal mailboxes. Do you want a big one? Do you want a small one? Do you want bronze? Do you want black? Do you want matte? Do you want gloss? What kind of flag do you want? You want a red flag? They got these new silver flags, which is weird. Mailbox flag should be red. We all know this. We're going through all these options. And finally, she basically picks the exact same one that she's already had for the last 20 years, which is perfectly fine with me because I know it's going to fit. So I'm cool, right? I get the box. Then we have to go to another aisle to get screws because what you don't know is that mailboxes don't come with anything but the box. I think this is a travesty. And to all the mailbox companies, this is something that should be rectified, but it is what it is, right? And my mom's going back and forth about the plastic still about like the plastic is not as good. And I'm like, Ma, you being real flippant about plastic, but these companies are companies for a reason. They're working for a reason. Somebody has thought this through, but whatever, right? She's going on as we walk down the aisle. She's in my ear about the plastic and how I'm wrong and et cetera, et cetera, because my mother can be petty sometimes. And it is what it is. We get to the screw section and I got to figure out which screws are the right screws. Fortunately for me, I bought, I bought the rusted screws with me, right? And so I show them to the lady. The lady helps me find something close enough. We get to the register. We buy the, I buy the mailbox and the screws. And what's funny about my mom is that my mom always tries to pay, though she knows I'm always going to pay, but it's a sweet gesture and she knows it. So we go through this whole song and dance. I, I get the mailbox. I get the screws. We get in the car. We go back to her house. Now... When I get back to the crib, I got to now figure out how to put the new mailbox on the post. And it takes like five minutes. It's four screws. It took me two hours to get it off the post because of all the rust, right? Um, but it takes me five minutes to put the four screws in the post and it's good to go. Why is this important to what we're talking about here? I mean, look, when I really thought about it and after I leave her house, it, it dawned on me what, what I'd experienced and what happened, right? I'm, I'm literally driving back to my house because uh, I had therapy at 11. So I had to be back on time to process this, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I realized, and I realized that like, like this is what we're actually doing. Like the mailbox It's fascinating to think about a mailbox in the way that my mom thinks about a mailbox. I don't think about a mailbox this way almost ever, right? But to my mother, she understood and she understands and she believes that we have to make sure that we protect the container of the letters. That we have to make sure that we protect the thing that contains the letters. And the reason why is because she understands the value of the letters. And so for her, it's like, well, I got to have a good mailbox and I got to make sure that I, that I take care of this mailbox, that I, get a, that, I, that, I, that I swap them out when I need to get a new mailbox um, and that it functions the way it's supposed to function because inside that mailbox are things that directly impact my life, right? I know for a fact that in that mailbox, there are things that I have to, that I'm going to be held accountable for. There are things uh, that are going to be coming from places that I've never seen, that I've never been, from friends I've, that I haven't seen in years, from strangers, right? Who knows what's going to be in there, Jay? Yeah, you may call it junk mail, but to me, it's mine, right? And it's important. It's got my name on it. Even if it's junk mail, all of it belongs to me. And that box is meant to protect those letters. And therefore, I have to protect the box, right? That's how this works. And when I think about what books do, when I think about what we're trying to do, when I, and even the way she talked flippantly about the plastic one, and I tried to explain to her, like, yeah, but somebody made that right? Somebody made that plastic box. Somebody really thought that through in the same way somebody thought through, through these metal ones, right? And the same way that we have so many options, right? And this is, what I, this is what it is to make books. This is what it is to write stories specifically for young people, right? A, another vulnerable population. It's the same thing. Literally, I thought to myself, oh, snap, really what's happening is I make mailboxes. We all are the creators of mailboxes, right? And it's the strangest thing to consider until you really consider it. It's like, yo, all I'm really trying to do is make sure, and this is also the reason why we have, we all have to have one. 
right? Everybody's got to have a mailbox. And the reason why is because we got to make sure that there is somewhere to put the letters. In my case, the letters exist in books. Literally, the letters exist in books. Um, I mean, when you really think about like what it meant to receive a piece of mail as a child and how everybody, when you're young and you get a piece of mail, why it means so much to you. And the reason it means so much to you is because you believe, number one, that you're important enough to be thought about, right? And number two, that somebody has sent you something from somewhere that you've never been, perhaps. Somebody has something to say to you and you alone. Your name is on that envelope, right? That's a really specific thing. And that is actually what we're doing, right? That's what it is. That's what's happening. And so we, we the writers, we the, the advocates, we the ambassadors have to do everything we can to protect the thing, the container of the letters, protect our books, protect our stories, because what they do is they serve as, 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 as not just... Um, uh, proliferators of responsibility, right? Because that's what it is for my mother, right? Her responsibilities are in there, but also the possibilities exist in there at the same time. That's where the coupons come. That's where the, that's where the thank you notes come. That's where the best wishes letters come. That's where the Christmas cards come. That's where, that's where the bills come. That's like everything is coming to that box, right? And the same thing exists in these books. That's where, that's where their thank you notes will be. That's where their get well messages will be. Their best wishes, their congratulations. That's where the bills, the things that teach them accountability and responsibility. All of those things exist and, they, and we have to protect it because the population that we're trying to do it for is just as vulnerable vulnerable as my mother. God forbid somebody gets their hands on these things and figures out how to take these things away, right? We're talking about a vulnerable population now compromised, just like my mother who believes that social security numbers are on every single thing. And perhaps she's not wrong. Maybe it's not a social security number, but there is an identity that can be stolen if we don't protect the containers of the letters. Something to think about. Right. I, I now I gotta call my mother and thank her for putting me through all that this morning. But as you all go on with your day, I hope it I hope it adds a little extra oomph to what it is that we've all signed up for. Right. We all signed up to make mailboxes, to protect mailboxes, to swap them out when they've gotten old and rusty, and to make sure that they're never taken away. Right. To protect the vulnerable and every letter that exists for them. Um and, and I hope that works for you. I hope you feel me on that. It's another strange message for me. At some point, somebody will put together a library of all my really strange lectures and talks. Um, but, but for this one, in this moment, uh, it feels particularly valuable to me in this moment. And I hope it feels just as valuable to you all. Thank y'all. Thank you so much, Jason, for your amazing words and your lesson on craft. And, um, and your example on, on the power of, of books and words and how, how important they are to us. So hi everybody, I'm Bonnie Bader. I am the coordinator of the Golden Kite Awards and I'd like to welcome you to our second virtual Golden Kite Gala. Um, this year, as, as last year, we have, uh, we will be presenting seven awards, diff seven different categories. And in each category, we have five finalists. And we will be meeting our finalists live on screen. And we will be finding out live the honor book and the winning book for each category. Each honor book receives $500 and an additional $250 to donate to a nonprofit organization of their choice. And each winner will receive $2,500 plus an additional $1,000 to donate to a nonprofit organization of their choice. This time, we will not only see all of our finalists, our honors, our winners on screen, but also our presenters uh, will be some of the judges who spent many, many hours, as, as Sarah said earlier, judging all of these amazing books. So now let's get on with the show. To present our first award, the Golden Kite Award for Picture Book Texts, I'd like to introduce the author of several renowned picture books, including Lift, The Perfect Seat, and let me finish, Min Lei. Min, welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and what an amazing way to start off the, the night. I'm going to have to text my neighbors so they're not confused. 
when they see me hugging my mailbox in the middle of the night <laughs> once this is done. Um, but good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to kick off this portion of our evening with the award for, for picture book text. Um, I'm presenting tonight on behalf of my fellow judges, Carol Lindstrom and Susan Hood. Um, and together, we read so many amazing picture books this year. But it was really a thrill and an honor to, to get to identify this cohort of stellar books. Um, so please join me in welcoming our finalists. I'm going to name them off and please come on, on screen when I call your name. Camille Andros, Winston Bingham, Alexandria Giardino, Joanna Ho, and Ann Winter. So welcome and congratulations, everyone. Thank you for your beautiful books. Um, before we announce the honor and the winner of this award, I wanted to briefly introduce the audience to your books, um, all of which I consider to be award worthy. Okay, first up, we have The Boy in the Sea, written by Camille Andros, illustrated by Amy Bates, published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. Um, like the ocean itself, Camille Andros' book sparkles on the surface while containing immense depth below. Um, as an author, I desperately wish I had written this book myself, um, but I'm so glad that we all get to enjoy it together as readers. Um, everybody, sorry, everybody in the Red Brick Building, written by Ann Winter, illustrated by Oge Mora, published by Balzer and Bray, HarperCollins. Now, um, those of you who have, have tried, it's not easy to come up with an original bedtime book, um, but Ann Winter did exactly that with this rollicking family read aloud full of fun to say words that build towards this joyous chaos. And then she does the impossible, she, gently winding things back down to, to guide readers towards sleep. Um, next up is Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, written by Joanna Ho, illustrated by Yum Ho, published by HarperCollins Books for Young Readers. Um, exquisite language and self-affirming metaphors swirl together in th this revolution of a book. Um, in Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, Joanna Ho opens our hearts and our eyes with a poetic celebration of both how we see the world and how we see ourselves. Next is Me and Tree, written by Alexandria Giardino, illustrated by Anna and Elena Balbuso, published by Creative Editions. Uh, this book is a, a tribute to the many secret stories that lay dormant within us. Um, Alexandria Giardino's magical book celebrates the connections, including those with nature that inspire us to discover and more importantly, share our own stories with the world. And finally, Soul Food Sunday, um, written by Winston Bingham, illustrated by C.G. Esperanza, published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. Um, this is a joyful celebration full of heart, delicious food, and traditions that are lovingly passed from generation to generation. Um, in Soul Food Sunday, Winston Bingham has served us all a true feast for the senses. So those are our finalists. Everyone give a round of applause to them. Um, and now, the honor for picture book text goes to... Winston Bingham for Soul Food Sunday. So Winston will give her charitable award to Start Lighthouse. Founded in Bronx, New York, Start Lighthouse is, um, sorry, they keep moving my screen. <laughs> Start Lighthouse is a nonprofit organization dedicated to narrowing the literacy gap through a social justice lens. So congratulations, Winston. Um, confession, there's nothing written on this card. I just had to use the, the majesty of an envelope for the, especially after what Jason just said. So I'm going to put this back in here. Okay, now, <clears throat> without further ado, the winner of the Golden Kite for Picture Book Text is Joanna Ho for Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. So Joanna will give her charitable award to First Book, a national nonprofit social enterprise dedicated to ensuring educational equity as a path out of poverty. So congratulations, Joanna. Wow. Um, thank you so, so much for this award. I'm beyond honored and so deeply humbled. Um, I never could have imagined this moment when I was sitting in the folding chairs at my first SCBWI conference. I had registered very last minute after someone looked at one of my first manuscripts and told me I should probably learn the craft. And she suggested I register for my local conference just a week away. At this and future SCBWI conferences, I heard talks that lit fires within, met fast friends, critique partners, and so many members of this warm and supportive writing community. 
creating a book and putting it into the world is truly the work of a team. I am so grateful for the wide net of people who catch, hold, sustain, and lift me on this journey. Thank you to my critique partners who've helped me to grow from the very beginning. Never ending thanks to my agent, Karen Wiseman, who never gave up on this story, even after it didn't sell for over a year and a half, who conveys her belief in me and my story so deeply that I always feel free to explore my heart. Thank you to my editor, Clarissa Wong, who made me cry and changed my life with her first email, who sees my words and knows how to guide them to speak my soul. And thank you to the entire Harper team. I feel so lucky to work with each and every one of you. My deepest thanks to Young Ho, whose brilliant and beautiful illustrations added layers and meaning to my words and brought them to such vibrant life. To my, uh, my family, Ama, Mom and Harv, Dave and Emily and Ming, my rascals, Carter and Isla, you are my everything. Every moment of love in this story is inspired by you. Prior to publication, I used to pray that Isaac Kiss in the Corners would find at least one child, one reader who needed it. I could not have imagined how widely it would be read. Thank you to Sharnay Gordon of Here We Read who hosted the cover reveal that started it all. To the readers, parents, educators, librarians, booksellers, and people who championed this book and shared it widely. That it continues to be shared shows me how hungry, starving even, the Asian community is for stories about people like us. We will not be invisible or silent any longer. My hope is that this book will join the works, the mailboxes, the containers of the letters of so many other incredible creators who have come before, who create now, and who will come tomorrow and become one, just one of a wide canon of stories that illuminate the power, strength, love, joy, solidarity of within between our communities. And this is one reason I chose firstbook.org as my nonprofit. First Book works towards educational equity by providing new books to youth in schools and communities who have been historically underserved and marginalized. They are the reason I was able to revamp my school's entire library and offer new worlds to students and staff. They are the intersection of my worlds of education, writing, and equity, and I know they are making a difference. Thank you so much to SCBWI for this award, for donating to this organization, and for supporting storytellers in this community and craft that will change the world. Thank you so much, Joanna, and congratulations again. And congratulations also to Winsome and all the rest of the amazing finalists. Now to present the Golden Kite Award for Picture Book Illustration, I'd like to introduce the illustrator of several wonderful picture books, including Poppy Takes Paris and the Little Wing series, as well as the illustrator and author of Penguin Cha Cha, Christy Valiant. Welcome, Christy. Hello, thank you. And I'd like to thank my fellow judges in the picture book illustration category, Katya Chien and Frank Morrison. We had a lot of fun looking through all these books. So now I'd like to welcome the Golden Kite Award finalists for picture book illustration to turn on their cameras. We have Misha Archer, Stephen Costanza, Lewin Pham, Adam Rex, and Raul III. Raul, I apologize that I can't roll my R's, so I can't pronounce your name properly. <laughs> so we had over 280 submissions in our category. So there were so many wonderful books. Great job, SEBWI members. Um, our top five finalists are Gladys the Magic Chicken, illustrated by Adam Rex, written by Adam Rubin, published by G.P. Putnam's Sons Books for Young Readers. From the end papers to the characters and expressions to the color choices and the perspectives, these illustrations were created by a master. Next up, we have King of Ragtime, the story of Scott Joplin, illustrated and written by Stephen Costanza, published by Athenaeum Books for Young Readers. The illustrations bring the biography to life with gorgeous shapes and colors that bounce like ragtime music. Each spread is a new dynamic design. Next up, we have Outside Inside, illustrated and written by Lewin Pham, published by Roaring Brook Press. This book captures the power of unity beautifully um, through the pandemic. 
And so the illustrations really show everything from the somber muted inside times that we had to the bright, beautiful outside times when we come back together. Next up is Vamos, Let's Cross the Bridge, illustrated and written by Raul III, colored by Elaine Bay, published by Versify. These illustrations are truly unique and original in its visual language, bold style, beautiful compositions, and unique point of view. Next up, we have Wonder Walkers, illustrated and written by Misha Archer, published by Nancy Paulson Books. These stunning detailed collages are majestic and full of wonder. They pull you in to see our whole world in a brand new way. So out of these wonderful books, the book we chose to be our honor book is Wonder Walkers by Misha Archer. Oh, I'm supposed to pull it out of the envelope like I saw Min do. I grabbed an envelope, so. Wonder Walkers by Misha Archer. Congrats, Misha. <laughs> Misha will give her charitable award to Barbershop Books, whose mission is to inspire Black boys and other vulnerable children to read for fun through child-centered, culturally responsive, and community-based programming and content. And now, okay, here's the envelope again. <laughs> Our book we chose to be the winner of the Golden Kite Award for Picture Book Illustration is King of Ragtime, the story of Scott Joplin by Stephen Costanza. Congratulations, Stephen. Stephen will give his charitable award to Musical Bridges Around the World, a nonprofit performing arts organization with the mission to celebrate our shared humanity by providing access to global arts for all. Well, thank you, Christy, so much. Um, this is really quite... Uh, Unbelievable. So um, I have some notes here I'd like to share with you right now. And um, I also brought my piano along too. So uh, first of all, thank you to everybody at the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and to all my peers and colleagues here today. To say it's an honor to be awarded the Golden Kite is an understatement. Just to be named as a finalist is reward enough. We artists can be hard on ourselves. Sometimes plagued with self-doubt and a lack of confidence in our abilities, we wonder, is my artwork good enough? Will people like this? Will kids like this? Well, while self-validation must ultimately come from within oneself, it certainly doesn't hurt when validation like this comes along. So again, thank you everybody for this wonderful, wonderful, great honor. Um, I mentioned I brought my piano along, so I just thought I would start by saying when I started taking piano lessons when I was a kid, this is in the, back in the mid 70s, there was a very popular song on the radio called The Entertainer. There were no words, it was just music, and it went something like this. Sure, it might sound familiar to some of you. Um, some of you have probably even played this song, but to a kid who was taking piano lessons, especially at that time, it was a rite of passage. If you could play the entertainer, you were definitely cool. Well, whether I was cool or not, it didn't matter. I fell in love with Scott Joplin's music and suddenly I needed to learn as many of his pieces as possible. And I wanted to know more about the man. Fast forward about 20 years to 1998, with a folio of illustrations and a few book dummies under my arm, I flew to Los Angeles to attend the annual SCBWI conference and to have my portfolio reviewed there. My career hadn't yet begun and I was both thrilled and nervous in anticipation of who among the several established illustrators would review my work. It was my great fortune to be reviewed by none other than Ashley Bryan, who, as you know, only recently passed away. It was the beginning of a long and wonderful friendship as Ashley was only a few hours drive from my home, it was easy to visit him in person. And anyone who has known Ashley would agree, especially if you are an artist, he was much more than your friend. He was mentor, champion, and advocate. His generosity, his laugh, his guiding hand is on every page of King of Ragtime, the story of Scott Joplin. And it is to Ashley that I dedicated the book. Now just a little bit on Scott Joplin. He wrote that song, The Entertainer in 1902. 
He wrote in a style of piano music known as ragtime. While Joplin didn't invent ragtime, it was in fact, he was in fact so good at it that in his day, he was known as the king of ragtime writers. Ragtime introduced mainstream America to the simple but radical trick of syncopation, that displacement of the beat, which causes a propulsion, a swinging of the hips, a feeling that anything might happen. Joplin's innovation in ragtime laid the foundation for much of the 20th century music, first blues, jazz and swing, then RB and rock and roll. In hindsight, we can see it as the first great impact of African-American culture on American society. Scott was born in Northeast Texas just four years after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the first generation of African-Americans born into the promise of freedom. In this book, I wanted to focus on Scott's early days. I wanted to share with readers his remarkable story. He left a great legacy, not only of music, but a great legacy of bravery and determination in the face of extreme adversity. I wanted to know, who was Scott? Who was this quiet kid? born into a generation of hardworking people, rising up from the ashes of enslavement and forging a new life in an often hostile world? Who was this musically gifted kid who grew up on a sharecropper's farm only later to be crowned a king, the king of ragtime writers? And what about Florence, his mother, who I believe to be the single greatest influence on his life? Who was she? All of this and more was what I wanted to convey in this book. It was not always easy but nothing could have prevented me from doing this book. I wanted to get Scott's story out there and I can't imagine what life would be without his music. It was a dream come true to see it published and the reward of a lifetime. And I thank you all again so much for this great honor. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations, Stephen. And also congratulations to Misha and the rest of our finalists. Now to present the Golden Kite Award, for nonfiction text for younger readers and the Golden Kite Award for nonfiction text for older readers. I'd like to introduce the author of many honored nonfiction books, including Sonny Rollins' Plays the Bridge, Strange Fruit and Dark Ways, um, and, and Strange Fruit and Dark Was the Night, Gary Golio. Welcome, Gary. Thank you very much, Bonnie. I actually like the title that you came up with there for a second, Strange Fruit and Dark Ways. I thought that was really one. It's a, it's a, new, it's a new book you could write. So, it's a you know, book just, I could just, write just next putting year. it out there. I love it. Thank you. Um, I do want to thank you for inviting me to be here. And thanks also to my author colleagues, Debbie Levy and Christina Suntornvat for their tireless devotion to the cause of reading over a hundred nonfiction books in younger and older categories. And right now I'd like to welcome the finalists for the a Nonfiction Text for Younger Readers Award, Gloria Amesqua, Cynthia Argentine, Martha Brokenbro, Cynthia Levinson, and Colleen Path. And actually, with Martha Broken Bro uh, is Grace Lynn, forgive me. So welcome to you all. And now I am going to give a short summary as I read the titles to the nonfiction text for younger readers books. Child of the Flower Song People, Luz Jimenez, Daughter of the Nawa by Gloria Amesqua, illustrated by Duncan Tonatiu, published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. Gloria Amesqua has done us all a great service by bringing to light the life of Luz Jimenez, a remarkable woman, teacher, and artist's model who became known as the soul of Mexico, celebrated by the indigenous Nahua people for good reason. The Great Stink, how Joseph, <laughs> the great stink, how Joseph Bazalget solved London's poop pollution problem by Colleen Paff, illustrated by Nancy Carpenter. Get thee to a stinkery. Rarely do we see a book about such a malodorous historical subject that is incredibly smart and informative, but also hilarious. 
Oh, the gross, rank, and putrid places you'll go. <laughs> Thirdly, I am an American. The Wong Kim Ark Story by Martha Brokenbro with Grace Lynn, illustrated by Julia Kuo, published by Little Brown Books for Young Readers. Immigration is a heated topic these days, as always, it seems. But we have Wan Kim Ark to thank for ensuring that every child born in these United States is granted birthright citizenship. Timely and illustrated in a way that makes the story read like a mini graphic novel. I especially love that. Night becomes day, changes in nature by Cynthia Argentine, published by Millbrook Press. Reading this book is like holding a sparkling nature documentary in your very own hands. An eye-opening concept matched by photos, definitely worth a thousand words. And The People's Painter, How Ben Shan Fought for Justice with Art, by Cynthia Levinson, illustrated by Evan Turk, published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. As a uh, visual artist myself for many years, as a landscape painter, I've long loved Ben Shan's work, but knew little about his origins. A Jew whose family left Russia because of violent attacks and discrimination, he used his art to champion the poor, the downtrodden, and the voiceless with great power. A good human being and a great artist, in my humble opinion. All right. Now, we are about to name the honor book for, and the honor author for the nonfiction text for younger readers. And we're going to ask Elvin Jones, who's in the spiritual realm right now, to do a drum roll in a jazz mode. And the honor book is going to go to Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia Levinson. Uh, and forgive me for this, but uh, Cynthia Levinson for The People's Painter. That's right. Hey, I'm 68 years old. You got to cut me some slack here, you know. Cynthia will give her charitable donation to the Highlights Foundation, which offers several scholarships to their many and diverse programs. And now we will you we will ask Mitch Mitchell of the Jimi Hendrix Experience to give us a drum roll for the winner of the Golden Kite Nonfiction Text for Younger Readers Award. And the winner, Gary just has to get his bearings here for a second. Just hold on, everyone. The winner is Colleen Paff for The Great Stink. A wonderful book. And Colleen will now deliver a short but memorable speech. And Colleen will give her charitable contribution to Access Books, an organization that provides quality books to public school and community libraries where the majority of students live at or below the poverty line. Colleen, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Gary, thank you so much. Um, is my microphone on right now? I'm so nervous. <laughs> I just wanna double check, okay, yes. Um, okay, um, thank you to the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and to the Golden Kite Award judges for this incredible honor. When I found out I was a finalist for this award, I felt so privileged to be in the company of the five authors that are the other finalists that I admire so much. Um, of course, it's always nice to be recognized for your work, uh, but to receive this kind of recognition from the organization that put me on the path to becoming a children's book author is really special. So first, I wanna thank the two people who started the CBWI. Thank you to Lynn Oliver and to Stephen Moser for creating the SCBWI. 
and for pouring so much love and time into this organization. And thank you to Sarah Baker for taking the reins. You have changed lives for writers and for readers, and I will be forever grateful to you and to the many volunteers and members who make the SCBWI the warm, supportive, professional organization that it is. Um, the Great Stink was my debut book, or is my debut book. Uh, I first heard about this smelly episode in British history when I was waiting for a plane in the Atlanta airport after a writing workshop. And luckily for me, my future agent, Clelia Gore, was also waiting for a plane at the same time. And so she was with me from the moment that I first heard about The Great Stink and said, I think this would make a great book for kids, um, all the way through the many revisions. And she was the one who had the incredible foresight to send it to Margaret K. McElderry Books, where my editor, Karen Wintilla, scooped it up. Um, I just, I feel so lucky that my manuscript ended up in Karen's hands and that she had the vision to ask Nancy to illustrate Nancy Carpenter and that Nancy said yes. Um, so thank you to the entire team at Margaret K. McElderry Books. I'm so grateful to you all and thank you, Nancy. Um, thank you also to my family for cheering me on, especially my husband, Warren, for his tremendous support, and my daughter, Koba, who still lets me read picture books to her every now and then, even though she's 26. Um, and finally, and I might start crying now, I'm going to try hard not to. <laughs> um, I just want to thank all of my friends, my writing friends and my non-writing friends, because this past year has been so difficult for so many people and most of us couldn't be together when um, my book launched and I know that was the same for so many people. Um, but uh, I really felt your love and support and it meant so much to me. Um, so I really appreciate you all and thank you so much to the SCBWI. I love you. <laughs> Thanks. Colleen, you got me all choked up there. Thank you, that was really beautiful. And congratulations again to you and to Cynthia. And now we're going to move on to the nonfiction text for older readers. And let me welcome the finalists for that category. Ariel Henley, Leah Henderson, Deborah Hopkinson. This is like all H's, you know that? Isn't that interesting? Steve Scheinkin and Anton Troyer. And everyone's here except for Anton. There he is. Okay, welcome, Anton. All right. So now we're going to look at the books themselves. Everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask. Young Reader's Edition by Anton Troyer, published by Levine Querido. A fa oh, yes, forgive me. Yes, okay. Anton Troyer has succeeded admirably in puncturing myths, opening minds, and allowing us all to feel more human as he answers both, <clears throat> excuse me, as he answers both nagging and delicate questions about Native peoples with great humor and insight. We all agree that this book is a much needed game changer. A Face for Picasso, Coming of Age with Cruzon Syndrome by Ariel Henley, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux Books for Young Readers. Ariel's book is a true miracle of persistence, compassion, and honesty. An exploration of truth and beauty, what it means to be a bright spirit living in a physical body, and a testament to the power of self-love grown within a devoted family. Fallout. Spies, super bombs, and the ultimate Cold War, War showdown. Just what we all need right now by Steve Scheinken, published by Roaring Brook Press. As hair raising as today's news might be, it's of some comfort to read how we've been here before. 
Russia and the U.S. squaring off on the international stage until, until cooler heads prevailed. This book actually gave me hope. Stay tuned. Together We March, 25 protest movements that marched into history by Leah Henderson, illustrated by Tyler Feeder, Fader published by Athenaeum Books for Young Readers. This book blew me away, a treasure of masterfully written histories of the many protests that have changed society as well as people's minds throughout the world. For caring young readers of conscience who want and hope to advocate for justice one day. And we must not forget Holocaust Stories of Survival and Resistance by Deborah Hopkinson, published by Scholastic Focus. As someone who has been the recipient of great love and support from Jewish friends and family throughout my life, this book particularly hit home. The powerful and heartfelt stories of those who survived the great Holocaust of modern times with integrity and wisdom intact. All right. For nonfiction text for older readers. Okay. And that book is, and that author is, Anton Troyer for everything you wanted to know about Indians, but were afraid to ask. Congratulations, Anton. Well deserved. Anton will give his charitable donation to Maiba, M A I B A a nonprofit organization of American Indian attorneys, law students, and officers of tribal courts. The organization also welcomes non-Indian attorneys and law students who are interested in Indian law. I am so thrilled to be honored with a golden kite for everything you wanted to know about Indians, but were afraid to ask. I was not expecting this, but I am so excited to be part of this community. There are so many people to thank. You know, the team at Levine Carrito has been amazing. Uh, Arthur Levine for believing in the work and reaching out to me. Nick Thomas really did a lot working with me on the, on the text and images and uh, working with me on the cover. Janice Schmeeding, who actually beaded, custom beaded the cover that was photographed for the book. <clears throat> Antonio and everyone else at Levine Creator has been just absolutely amazing. I've been thinking a lot, you know, as I worked on this book and then its subsequent reception, which has been kind of overwhelming, about the young people that we are reaching out to and serving of all races and backgrounds. And I just think it is so critical the work that everyone is doing to bring the golden kites into being and all of the networking between all of the wonderful artists and authors, because it has done a lot to elevate marginalized voices and to help all of us better see and understand the world that we all live in and that our young people will be navigating for the rest of their lives. I chose the Minnesota American Indian Bar Association as a recipient for uh, for the philanthropic gift, because my mother uh, had a really kind of, to me, stunning experience. She grew up in extreme poverty in the center of the Leech Lake Reservation. She met one professional Native person ever her entire childhood. That was the school nurse. And she thought, maybe I can do that. And her first job was working for the tribe with their health program. And she thought, wow, Natives are getting pushed around and ended up going on to get a law degree and became the first female native attorney in the state of Minnesota. That of course inspired me as I saw her throughout my childhood with powwow braids and a suit, being the only woman in court and the only native person in court. And it just had these ripple effects uh, throughout my life. So, you know, she passed away at the start of the pandemic in 2020 and wanted to honor her and her in her will, she wanted to uh, start a scholarship for native students through that organization. So that's why I picked that one, but I think it really reflects on the work that we're all doing, you know, to try to elevate marginalized voices for, for native kids to see someone like them making it in this world. And for all of us to see people of all backgrounds um, raising their voices through literature, 
art and all kinds of other things. So I'm so deeply honored to be part of this broad organization and network of people and to receive the golden kite. I feel truly honored. Thank you so much. Of the golden kite, nonfiction text for older readers award, Ariel Henley. For a face for Picasso, coming of age with Cruzon syndrome. Ariel will give her charitable donation to My Face, a nonprofit organization dedicated to changing the faces and transforming the lives of children and adults with differences. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um, I did not see this coming. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of speechless right now. I'm trying really hard not to start sobbing. Um, I like to tell people that I didn't grow up with books about people like me. I never got to see faces like mine in the media. As a child, there was never a single book that I got to read about someone with Cruzon syndrome, about someone with a facial disfigurement, about someone with the medical trauma like I was experiencing. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I, I wasn't expecting this. So I wasn't like mentally prepared to tell myself to not cry. Um, but, but I tell people this and, and I often feel dramatic when I say that, but, but it's true. Um, and so writing this book uh, was my dream because I never wanted um, another kid to grow up without seeing themselves the way that I did. And when my book came out in November, I got um, a couple of messages on social media of, of kids with craniofacial conditions holding my book in Barnes and Noble. And I have no words to explain what that means. Um, so thank you for, for selecting my book. Thank you for reading it. Thank you to my family for, for being so supportive and for, for always encouraging me to um, speak my truth. And I tried really hard to be honest in this book and to share my story in a way that wasn't always pretty and didn't have, I don't know, a hallmark Christmas bow on top of it, but but shared what it was really like to grow up in a society where our worth is determined by our appearance and what, what it means to have your appearance change and what it means to have 60 surgeries by the time you graduate from high school um, and to come to terms with what your identity is while experiencing that. And so this book saved my life. Writing it gave me meaning and purpose and so it just, it means everything in the world to me to be able to share it with the world. Thank you to my editor, Grace Kendall, and everyone at FSG. Um, thank you to my agent, Rachel Latovsky. Yeah, just thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Congratulations and thank you so much to Ariel, to Anton, to Colleen, and to Cynthia. Now to present the Golden Kite Award for middle grade fiction, I'd like to introduce the award-winning author of many books, including Fat Kid Rules the World, The Next Great Jane, and Pieces of Why, K.L. Going. Welcome, K.L. Hello, thank you so much for having me here this evening. It's an honor to be here. And um, I don't know about all of you, but this is gonna be a very expensive night for me because I feel like I need to buy every single book that's been listed so far. Um, and I bet there's a lot of us who feel that way. <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome the middle grade finalists to turn on their cameras. Adriana Cuevas, Sunday T. Frazier, Supriya Kelker, Victoria Piantek, and Rajani Laraka. And before I begin the announcements, I'd just like to take a minute to thank my fellow judges, Joel Parker Rhodes and Debbie Michiko Florence. This was really a daunting task. There were so many great books to read, 
Um, but working with two such lovely people made it so much easier. So thank you to my fellow judges. And now the Golden Kite finalists for middle grade fiction are Better with Butter by Victoria Piantek, published by Scholastic Press. Better with Butter represented the perfect union of kid appeal and meaningful themes. Any child with anxiety will relate to Marvel's struggles, yet the story was told with humor and hope, celebrating bravery in every form. Cuba in My Pocket by Adriana Cuevas, published by Farrar Strauss Giroux Books for Young Readers. Cuba in My Pocket is a wash in sensory details that bring both Kumba's original home in Cuba and his new home in Florida alive. One of my fellow judges said, this story is everything. It made my heart ache for every immigrant child coming to the US hoping for refuge. Mighty Inside by Sundy T. Frazier, published by Levine Clarito. This book is a celebration of friendship between two unforgettable characters. The 1955 setting allows the reader to explore themes such as institutional racism, the incarceration of Japanese people, the brutal murder of Emmett Till, the power of communities coming together, and yet nothing overpowers Melvin's journey to find his own unique voice. Red, White, and Whole by Regine Laraca, published by Quiltry. Red, White, and Whole is a beautifully written and incredibly emotional story that never loses sight of hope. This 1980s coming of age novel in verse celebrates love of all kinds, that which we find through our parents, extended families, friendships, romantic relationships, and through the many communities to which we all belong. Strong as Fire, Fierce as Flame by Supriya Kelker, published by Two Books. Strong as Fire, Fierce as Flame, set in 1857 India, features a young heroine who readers will root for from beginning to end. The story kept us in suspense and we loved the theme of female empowerment. The main character has a huge character arc, moving from a desire for safety to taking life and death risks for a cause that she believes in. So congratulations to all of the finalists. And now the Golden Kite Honor Book is Cuba in My Pocket by Adriana Cuevas. Congratulations, Adriana. Adriana will give her charitable award to Lambda Literary's LGBTQ Writers in Schools program, which provides critically necessary safe spaces for students to talk about great books, queer life, and how to thrive as an LGBTQ person. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, the Golden Kite Award winner for the category of middle grade fiction goes to Red, White, and Whole by Regine Laraca. Regine will give her charitable award to the World Literacy Foundation, a global not-for-profit that works to lift young people out of poverty through literacy. Congratulations to all of you. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. Um, Thank you so much uh, to SCBWI and the Golden Kite Committee for this incredible honor. I can't tell you what it means to me that you chose uh, Red, White and Hold, this book of my heart as the winner of the 2022 Golden Kite Award for middle grade. Congratulations, first of all, to all my fellow finalists, Victoria, Adriana, Sandy and Supriya. I love your books and I'm honored to be among you. Thank you to my critique partners, most of whom I met because of SCBWI, without whom I never could have written a thing. Uh, thank you to my agent, uh, Brent Taylor, the best publishing partner in the world. Thank you to my incredible editor, Alexandra Cooper, and Rosemary Brosnan, and everyone at Quiltree Books who published this book so beautifully and have supported it in every way. So uh, Red, White, and the Hole is about a girl who feels torn by all the different things she is, Indian and American, daughter and friend, powerful and powerless. 
And when I wrote it, I poured so much of my heart and true emotion into it that I was truly terrified that no one else would want to read it uh, and that no one would care about it even if they did read it. And then somehow we sold it quickly and spectacularly to the perfect home. And I felt that all my literary dreams had come true in February, 2020. Well, you all know what happened to the world right afterwards. My job, my job as a doctor changed overnight. And over the last two years, we have all dealt with so much loss. And my own family has dealt with separation and hospitalizations and death. And in the face of such difficulties, I wondered whether it was okay to celebrate things like the publication of books, even one that meant as much to me as Red, White, and Whole. But then I reflected on all the good that has happened in the midst of these trying times. Um, more time with, more, with those that we love, the recognition of what is truly precious in our lives, and moving towards justice and understanding and peace. And at the urging of my family and friends, I let myself celebrate when the book came out. In the midst of these strange times, I just want to touch a little bit about uh, and talk about contradictions, not trying to change or fix them, but acknowledging them and holding them, because in many ways, that is what Red, White, and Whole is all about. It's about being different things and experiencing love and joy and pain, wondering whether you belong or if you belong anywhere, about experiencing the worst thing you can imagine and somehow finding a way to go on, about feeling divided, but finding a way to be whole. All you need to do is look at the diversity on our beautiful planet to recognize that we are all different from one another. And stories help us celebrate those differences. But also, I can tell you as a writer and a doctor that we humans are all very much fundamentally the same. We all crave safety and love and understanding. And stories can help us recognize that as well. When I talk to young people about Red, White, and Whole, I tell them that none of us is just one thing. And that is what makes us beautiful. I also tell them that I'm very much the same person I was when I was a kid. The biggest difference is that I love more people now and I'm curious about even more. And today I'm writing stories for that kid that I used to be. So I wanna end by addressing all the creators in our virtual room, published and pre-published. You are my writing partners, my friends, and some are people that I've never met. I wanna tell you that I am one of you and I am with you. And if you ever wondered whether you should write the story of your heart, you should. And if you ever wondered when to do it, the time is now. I am still trying to write about things that I care about and the best way to turn them into stories for young people. I am still struggling with the yearning for the perfect words when all I find is imperfection. I am proud to be in that struggle with you, the community that helps create stories so we can understand what it is to be human. I am full of contradictions and I'm holding them all. I'm holding you all. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations, Rajani. And also congratulations to Adriana and all the other finalists in this category. Now to present the Golden Kite Award for illustrated book for older readers, I'd like to introduce the illustrator and author of such amazing books as Little Elliot, Where is Bina Bear, and Flamer, Mike Curado. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Bonnie. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Hello, everyone. Wow, I'm just like brimming with emotion now. I'm, I'm so excited for uh, all of the finalists and all of the winners. Um, and I'm so honored to be a part of this and bring you even more. Um, ooh, I'm nervous. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my fellow judges, Lauren Castillo and Victoria Jameson for all of your time and consideration. Um, the nominees for illustrated books for older readers are Famita Asim, Eugene Yelchin, and unfortunately, Floyd Cooper's family, Remy Lai and Amanda Mihangos could not be with us tonight. Uh, but we offer our congratulations to all of them uh, on being finalists. Um, and uh, Eugene and Famita, are you with us on screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, hi. Hi, okay, I see you all now, thank you. Um, so uh, now I just want to uh, say a little bit about each book. 
Thank you. The nominees are The right. Genius Under the Table, written and illustrated by Eugene Yelchin, published by Candlewick Press. Drama, Family Secrets, and the KGB Spy in His Own Kitchen. How will Yevgeny ever fulfill his parents' dream that he become a national hero when he doesn't even have his own room? And I'm sorry, that was supposed to be Yevgeny. Sorry, Eugene. With a masterful mix of comic timing and disarming poignancy, Yelchin recounts in hilarious detail his childhood in Cold War Russia as a young boy, desperate to understand his place in his family. Whimsical spots in graphite bring this story to life. Paul Casso, written and illustrated by Remy Lai. Published by Henry Holt and Company, Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Macmillan. This beautifully illustrated graphic novel is the story of an unexpected friendship between the loneliest girl in class and the coolest canine in town. Joe befriends an adorable basket-toting dog and is mistaken as his owner. Excited to make new friends, Joe reluctantly hides the truth, but what starts as a chihuahua-sized lie quickly grows Dane size, Great Dane-sized when Animal Control receives complaints about a dog roaming the streets off-leash. With Paul Casso's freedom at stake, is Joe willing to spill the truth and risk her new friendships? Samira Serfs, illustrated by Mamita Asim, written by Roxana Ghidro, published by Coquila, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Samira Serfs is the story of an 11-year-old Rohingya refugee living in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, who finds strength and friendship in a local surf club for girls. This tender novel in verse follows Samira's journey from isolation and persecution to sisterhood and from fear to power. Famita's striking black and white spot illustrations pull us into Samira's world. The Sea Ringed World, Sacred Stories of the Americas, illustrated by Amanda Mijangos, written by Maria Garcia Esperon, translated by David Bowles published by Levin Carido. 15,000 years before Europeans stepped foot in the Americas, people had already spread from tip to tip and coast to coast. Like all humans, these Native Americans sought to understand their place in the universe, the nature of their relationship with the divine and the origin of the world into which their ancestors had emerged. The answers lay in their sacred stories. Amanda's gorgeously illustrated motifs accompany each ancient tale. And finally, Sprouting Wings, illustrated by Floyd Cooper, written by Louisa Jogger and Sherry Becker, published by Crown Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Random House Children's Books, a division of Penguin Random House. The inspirational and true story of James Herman Banning, the first African-American pilot to fly across the country comes to life in this picture book biography. James always dreamed of touching the sky, but how could a farm boy from Oklahoma find a plane? And how would he learn to fly it? None of the other pilots looked like him. In a journey that would span 3,300 miles, take 21 days and inspire a nation, James Herman Banning proved that you can't put barriers on dreams. As always, Floyd's art gives the heart wings. We will always be grateful for his contributions to children's literature. And now, the honor for the illustrated books for older readers goes to Eugene Yelchin for The Genius Under the Table. Eugene will give his charitable award to the Dream Builders Project, whose mission is to ultimately make the world a better place through social campaigns and raising awareness and funds for genuine nonprofit organizations. Congratulations, Eugene. And now <laughs> the winner of the illustrated books for older readers goes to Famida Asim for Samira Serfs. Famida will give her charitable award to the Rohingya Children's Projects a grassroots volunteer-led nonprofit that gives educational and vocational training to young Rohingya refugees 
while also providing them with supplies, resources, and community awareness programs. Congratulations. And now a few words from Amita. I, I, I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, so uh, I'd say I'm speechless, but I actually did write a speech just in case. Um, first of all, thank you to the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. It's my honor to be a part of this community that's dedicated to bringing compassion and joy to children around the world, including to kids like Samira, re refugee children that millions of them around the world need. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, just, I wasn't, I, <laughs> okay, to be honest, I'm still not over how uh, I get to draw pictures for a living and make books. Uh, this was all a very far away dream of mine when I was a kid myself. Um, no one ever told me this was an option. I mean, I was, I was born in Mohipalfeni, Bangladesh, y'all. It's so small, not even other Bangladeshis know where it is. Uh, it, um, I, but that just makes all of this mean so much more to me. Like I, I'm shaking. Um, it is amazing to be recognized by people and an industry that I love and look up to that have accepted me. Um, I, I'm filled with so much gratitude, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right to it. I want to thank um, the writer of Samira Serves, Ruxana Didros. Thank you for being so empathic. And um, I want to thank my faithful art director, Jasmine Ribeiro, my uh, wonderful editor Joanna Cardenas and the rest of our team at Coquila. And I of course want to shout out my agent Lily Garmai. You are always looking out for me. You're why I'm here. And I'd love to thank my bestest friends in the world, Ayu, Claire, Annette, and Julia. Um, um, they've been my friends since I was 10 years old, and if it weren't for them believing in me, I wouldn't have been able to believe in myself and really be here and make these stories for you. So thank you. Thank you, everyone who really stuck it out for me. I'm Excuse me, I'm just, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to go cry in another room. Thank you and congratulations, Famita, and also congratulations to Eugene and the other finalists in this category. To present our final award, the Golden Kite Award for Young Adult Fiction, I'd like to introduce the author of several notable novels, including Tell Me How You Really Feel, this is all your fault and not the girls you're looking for. Amina May Safi. Welcome, Amina May. Hello, everyone. It is so lovely to see everyone. Um, I have been trying really hard not to cry while everyone has these gorgeous, heartfelt speeches uh, because I knew I was going on last and I didn't want my mascara to run, but it's been a little difficult. Um, I was talking with my fellow judges when we were deliberating about how beautiful it is to get to celebrate books and get together and celebrate books. And thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to my fellow judges, Amy Spaulding and Bill Konigsberg, who made the following readings and deliberations such a joy to do. Thank you to all of the candidates who made reading all of these books this year so wonderful. We had our work cut out for us in the best way. Oh, the Golden Kite Award finalists for young adult fiction are Olivia Abtahi, Jared Rack, Pamela N. Harris, Sheba Kareem, and Melinda Lowe cannot be here with us, but we offer her congratulations as a finalist. All right, everyone on. There we are. 
Y'all ready? <laughs> There's my cue. I was like, I'm waiting. <laughs> All right. Donuts and Other Procl Proclamations of Love by Jared Reck, published by Knopf Books for Young Readers. Donuts and Other Proclamations of Love is a gorgeous exploration of love, family, and a life built outside of the common pathways that so many young people are given. Oscar Olson wants to get through his senior year and take over his grandfather's food truck, but life has other plans for Oscar, much in the way life has other plans for us all. A beautiful meditation on family, best laid plans, and falling in love in the most unexpected of places. Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe, published by Dutton Books for Young Readers. Last Night at the Telegraph Club is a lyrical story about the ways in which love, desire, and self burst against the seams of a world that wants you to live quietly and within the bounds that someone else gave you. When Lily Ho steps, on, steps into the Telegraph Club, she sees what it really could mean to live a life in full Technicolor, a triumphant and hopeful story set in a time simmering with tension, not unlike our own. The Marvelous Mirza Girls by Sheba Karim, published by Quill Tree Books. The Marvelous Mirza Girls is one part travelogue, one part mother-daughter tale, and one part meditation on the aftershocks of grief. Noreen Mirza travels to Delhi on a once in a lifetime adventure with her mother that simmers with all of the heart, grief, and anxieties that Noreen tried to leave behind in the States. A story that unfolds like the great old tales of the oral storytellers and one that features a heroine that so many young women of color are never allowed to see, much less be. The Marvelous Mirza Girls shows how messy and glorious life can be if you're paying attention. Perfectly Parveen by Olivia Abtahi, published by G.P. Putnam and Sons Books for Young Readers. Perfectly Parveen is a hilarious laugh out loud and tender debut, which allows readers to explore the heavier themes of xenophobia, diaspora, and assimilation. Parveen Mohammadi is a girl who has been told she is too much and who tries to fit herself more neatly into the box of acceptable girl to regain the attention of her crush. Instead, she discovers more about her own voice, her own family, and her own friends than she ever had in mind as she sets out on to be a quest to be the kind of girl that boys like. As an aside, none of us judges will be able to look at a bassoon the same way ever again. When You Look Like Us by Pamela N. Harris, published by Quill Tree Books. When You Look Like Us is an utterly enchanting debut novel which allows readers a window into the life of Jay Murphy, a young black scholar living in a tough section of the Newport News, Virginia. When Jay's sister, Nicole, disappears, we come to understand the, the struggle that comes from the stereotypes and assumptions of everyone involved, from the police to Jay himself, an impossible to put down story with an invaluable message. And please give a round of applause. Uh, I know we're all like muted uh, for all of the finalists. They've all written gorgeous, beautiful books. And I'm so proud of all of you. I know that's cheesy, but I am this cheesy. I'm an earnest horse girl. All right, I copied Min and I literally got out some envelopes. So are we ready? The honor book for the Golden Kite Award for young adult readers in 2022, I'm just dragging this out, is Perfectly Parveen by Olivia Abtahi. Olivia will give her charitable award to the Word for Diversity, an organization that promotes voices from underserved communities and diverse backgrounds, honors stories of those who have faced adversity and injustice, and works to provide a sanctuary space where these groups will see themselves in literature. Congratulations, Olivia. And the winner of the YA Golden Kite Award 2022. This is so fun. I love the drama of this. This is like, I really, I hope you all hear a little drum roll. You ready? It's coming out. When You Look Like Us by Pamela N. Harris. 
Pamela will give her charitable award to the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Richmond, a nonprofit organization that benefits the lives of individuals with Down syndrome and their families through individual and family support, education, community awareness, and advocacy. And now we'll get to hear from Pamela. Congratulations. I'm sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> I was just texting my cousin and I was like, okay, well, I'm ready to eat like my cookie dough ice cream because I'm like, it's about to be over. I did not expect this. Um, okay, I have to pull up something to say. Um, when I found out that my debut novel, When You Look Like Us, was a finalist for the Golden Kite Awards, I was beyond thrilled. SCBWI has been an integral part of my writing journey. I still remember flying to LA and attending my first SCBWI conference over a decade ago with said cousin that I just mentioned. <laughs> As someone in the world of academia, I'm a frequent flyer of the conference scene and my experiences have not always been so pleasant, but SCBWI felt different. My fellow attendees welcomed me with open arms and the authors and agents and editors were so approachable, not nearly as scary as I imagined that they would be. I remember being inspired by presentations from Matt De La Pena and Kwame Alexander and the Judy Bloom. Um, their words made me feel like maybe my dreams of being a published writer weren't so far-fetched. And now here I am being recognized alongside brilliant writers that I admire. I wrote When You Look Like Us to bring necessary attention to missing Black girls whose cases are too often ignored, dismissed, or downplayed. I wanted them to know that they matter, that their stories and their experiences and their lives matter. I also wrote this novel so that people who look like me or my characters can see themselves on the pages. And so that everyone who does not look like us could gain a little bit more empathy for black and brown children. I wanna thank SCBWI for not only helping my dreams come true, but for also helping me lift the voices of black children and teens. Thank you to Beyonce and Escalchi and Andrew Eliopoulos for helping me mold and shape this story to what it is now. Uh, thank you to Karen Chaplin and Rosemary Brosnan for wanting to continue making magic with me. Thank you to my first agent, Sarah LaPala, for not giving up on me after almost a decade, like almost a decade on this roller coaster ride together. And also, thank you to my current agent, Natalie Lacassil, for putting up with all my anxiety and insecurities. Um, I want to give a special thank you to my mom and my cousin, Marquita, and my best friend, Raquel, who I know are watching. They have been, like, by far, like, my biggest cheerleaders in my life. So I just want to thank you guys for always having my back. And um, thank you for supporting the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Richmond, who have been an excellent resource and support system for my son and me. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you and congratulations, Pamela, and congratulations also to Olivia and all the other finalists in this category and all the winners and all of the honorees and all of the finalists. I have to say that I am really happy. I put on waterproof mascara because all the speeches just brought me absolutely to tears. And now I'd like to welcome back Sarah Baker. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, oh, whew, I'm verklempt. Um, This was amazing. I'm so happy for everyone. Everyone at SCBWI is so proud to be able to showcase these amazing books and these amazing creators. Um, it's been a fantastic evening. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us and congratulations again to all of the finalists, honors, and winners. All of their books are available to purchase at the scbwibookshop.org site. And let's all keep making books and protecting those letters and those mailboxes for young people everywhere. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs>